Good morning. My name is Don Michaelman, and I want to welcome you to the Planning and Zoning Commission special meeting on Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. And this is a special meeting by the fact that it is for the commission members to ask questions, and that is the only thing that will be occurring during this meeting here. Kaylee, would you do a roll call of members? Yes. Ted Gamboji. Present. Stan Goligoski. Here. Thomas Hutchison. Present. Greg Lizell. George Lee. Present. Butch Tracy. Here. Don Michaelman. Present. From the City Council, we have three members here Phil Good, Steve Siska, and Kathy Brucing. This is an open public meeting and is being tape recorded and videotaped by the city. <clears throat> the proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media, the public and local cable and or radio stations, and may also be rebroadcast. The number of commission members present is six. It will require four votes for majority. As some individuals may be attending this meeting remotely, all parties wishing to be heard, including commission members, are asked to state their name prior to speaking in order to ensure accurate minutes. Members of the public when called upon are required to state their name and address for the record so that we may know who is speaking and be able to contact them later at a later date if necessary. To start off, George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a reminder, because we are doing this partially via Zoom, please use your microphones when you're speaking and please take them away from you when you're not. Thank you. Um, this is a special call meeting. Um, we appreciate the patience of the Planning and Zoning Commission to hold this meeting. Uh, the intent of the meeting, as you stated, uh, Mr. Michaelman, is to give every opportunity to ask us questions. If you have them, talk to each other in regard to these items. As you're well aware, we. Um, we held two meetings talking about both the north and the south annexations. We covered parts of both in both meetings. We have a question regarding whether or not um, the full discussions had occurred or had given an opportunity for each of you to ask all the questions necessary. Hence, this meeting has been called. Um, I do have a very brief presentation, if you'll indulge me, just to give you an idea. We've, we've had a lot of comments regarding the open space uh, designations as shown on the master plans that were submitted specifically for the south um, annexation. And I'd like to just step through these real briefly just to show you some of the progression that's occurred since the original submittal until the most recent submittal, which is before you for action on the master plan today. So I apologize for getting you off track just a little bit, but I think it's important to kind of reframe the whole position of where we are and why we're here. So back in 2018, the original submittal to us is the uh, picture on the left-hand side of the screen. That original submittal included a lot of private open space, and a lot of development in areas that are currently open space. So it accounted for a total of 31% of the project area as a combination of public and private open space. So it started out at 31% and it was both public and private. A revision was submitted to us at the, in 2019, um, basically at the end of the year, near the end of the year, that showed a larger area of open space to be donated to the public. It would become city of Prescott owned, and that's the real bright green, not the olive green on the maps. Uh, that bright green by itself accounts for 33% of the project area as public open space. So we've gone from a combination of private and public at 31 to 33, just specifically for the public. And I did not do the calculation, including the uh, the private open space shown on this one because it sort of has been supplanted by a further uh, change. Just a zoomed in version of that original map, there was a lot of development in areas that are very sensitive. 
And the original proposal was very controversial, as you recall, uh, and significant changes have occurred as a result of that controversy. So in 2020, we received uh, another update. This one is a result of the discussions that were associated with the LOI that the city attorney talked to you about at the beginning of your last meeting. That LOI is the letter of intent. It is a non-binding letter of uh, agreement on some core concepts that then becomes binding as it's developed into a development agreement, a contract later. So that was a significant change from the public open space in 2019 at 33% to the public open space in 2020 of 55%. Just a little bit of a comparison. Again, all of that open space, um, most of that open space occurs where previously there were intended development uh, of single family residential lots or neighbor, neighborhood subdivisions. And just for comparison, in the AED North Master Plan, they laid out specifically to be uh, donated to the city a combination of the area that's shown in OS on this map and the area shown airport impact, which will become NOS, and we discussed that at the last meeting. That combination is 45% of the land area of the north goes to public open space. I had at least a couple of questions about how much we could mandate to be open space through the process of PAD, because we mentioned PADs a number of times at the last meeting and the meeting prior to that. Uh, under our land development code, a PAD, a planned area development, allows flexibility in the location, size, and setbacks of lots in return for setting aside open space. You're required to set aside 25% of the area of, of that individual subdivision. Each subdivision is treated independently. That 25% can be private open space or public open space at the discretion of the applicant and council. If it's to be given to the city as public open space, it requires the city agree to it. Otherwise, the applicant for the subdivision can create private open space. Again, the open space um, can include things that you wouldn't normally can open space in a PAD. Landscape areas, landscape street meetings. Um, one thing I didn't add on here is uh, if, if you were put in uh, Tennis courts, for instance, you can count the tennis courts as open space. Not something that most people want to count as open space, but our code allows it. Again, the idea of the PAD process is to allow uh, flexibility in the design of the subdivision, but to give some benefit to providing services and open space and parks and recreation needs within that subdivision that aren't placed as a demand on the city in general. So allowing the, the tennis courts to count because you don't have to provide tennis courts elsewhere in the city to account for the new residents of that subdivision they provide themselves. So it's not the kind of thing that we normally see as, as uh, open space in this discussion. We really haven't talked about any kind of, of active recreational use or street meetings for the natural open space or the public open space that's being negotiated uh, for the AED annexations or through the AED annexations. So I think that's just to catch up to a little bit on the question of open space and how much of a, a change has occurred over time. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer. Um, certainly during the conversation, I'd be happy to answer questions that occur. Uh, with that, I believe that this is intended to be your meeting and we're here to answer your questions as you need. Commission members, are there anybody that has a question of George specifically right now? If not, are there any questions concerning with AED South annexation? I will not read through all of that. I'll just abbreviate it there. Uh, I just wanted to note that I do have one speaker request form, Don. I know you have stated this is a commissioner discussion, but I wanted to bring that up to you and Don to entertain. John, I have a question. <clears throat> Since this basically is a meeting for the commission members <clears throat> to ask questions, are we open for the public to ask questions when 
Mr. Chairman, you are not required at this point to take any public comment. It would be your, at your discretion whether you wanted to hear public comment or not, but uh, it, it, there's no requirement since we've had uh, two public hearings with uh, a substantial number of comments. I'll do it informal with what the commission members prefer to hear the comment that came in. This is Ted Gamboji, yes. All right, go ahead and read it. Okay, uh, it's for Tom Rusing, and he's actually here, so I'll let him speak for himself. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Tom Rusing, 2194 Forest Mountain Road in Prescott. I am speaking as a concerned private citizen, not as a member of any group. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for volunteering to be uh, to serve on this important planning and zoning commission, looking out for the interest of the people of Prescott and the vision of Prescott's future. I would like, especially like to thank those members who requested additional deliberation on this very important and controversial AED uh, annexation, thereby allowing more time to deliberate and listen to citizen input. <coughs> planning a uh, site visit and requesting additional information such as the critical development agreement. Many of us have been surprised and concerned that this commission and members of the city council uh, still do not have access to the development agreement while city staff uh, does. Many citizens, uh, uh, many cities, sorry, many cities have all available material to their PNZ commissioners so that they can make the best and most informed uh, decision for the citizens. Regarding the site visit, a picture is worth a thousand words. I know from personal experience that going out and touring the site with a knowledgeable person such as Joe Baines or Walt Anderson can give you an entirely different perspective on the situation and impact your decisions. Uh, current city council members who took time to do this have been awestruck, awestruck by the experience, <clears throat> uh, experience and gained a better appreciation of the importance of this annexation. Maps and even drone footage help, but it's not the same as being on the site, seeing what hikers and bikers, adults and children will experience and how it will be affected by your decisions. There is no rush, we need to do this right. Regarding zoning for K and L, the extensive negotiations and letter of intent indicate that this area will be an eco-friendly resort that blends in with the environment or nothing. It would revert to open space, either private or public, if it's uh, resort was not uh, uh, built. Granting SPC zoning does not guarantee this outcome. It gives the developer significant flexibility and severely limits the city's ability to control the outcome and follow through on desires of the citizens. It is very difficult for, and perhaps unlawful to pull back on zoning once it is granted. But it is, it is easy to convert from natural open space to a resort in the future. I strongly request that you change the zoning of KNL to natural open space. It will be easy to change when an acceptable solid plan is brought forth in the future. Finally, I and many others are somewhat baffled by repeated attempts by some of the city staff, including the city attorney, to tie your hands and try to limit your deliberations and recommendations to only zoning issues. You are a planning and zoning commission, not just a zoning body. I urge you to consider the vision of the people of Prescott for our future as laid out in the general plan an open space plan. The citizens of Prescott spoke loudly and clearly in the last election about how strongly we feel about these issues and specifically this project. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. Is there any questions for the doctor? I've got one. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lucy, uh, the last time you spoke, you spoke on, um, if you will, did you speak on uh, transition areas within um, buffer zone? Buffer zones. The buffer zones, was that okay? <clears throat> I just, um, and the uh, buffer zones as well as the uh, crossing of the Peavine Trail were too specific. In the buffer zones that you referred to, it, uh, it was that actually in the actual zone, the uh, planned zoning areas, or within the open space? What was your What was your most concern? I well, think. I think if you look at the developments that have gone in, there are, there can be housing and walls right up to the edge of the easement for um, uh, the trail. And the National Historic Peavine Trail is obviously a precious resource. And the experience people are going to have on that trail is going to be significantly impacted by what 
uh, comes up to that trail and what kind of buffer we have between the trail and the, and the homes. And I think it'll be a benefit for trail users as well as homeowners that there is some type of separation. And I think I showed some techniques where you can have a variable level uh, landscaping trees and uh, uh, fences, whether they're uh, preferably not a, a hard block wall, but fences as well as higher trees and lower tapering down to natural vegetation by the trail. No, I just want to let you know that really stuck with me, especially within those planned zone areas. So we'll be looking out for that. You need to use your microphone, please. We can't Thank hear you. you. Yeah, no. Oh, a little bit closer. I just want, just to reiterate, I just wanted to let you know that that really did stick with me, those buffer zones within the planned zoned areas. Uh, so we'll be looking out for that when, uh, when we do get the plat. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Any other questions for the doctor? Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, just a, a brief clarification of the SPC zone. <clears throat> Um, as you're all aware, because you, you've read our land development code pretty thoroughly, the SPC, SPC zoning district doesn't have any permitted uses spelled out in it. So without a master plan and without approved uses, it is effectively unusable until that master plan is approved. So it is not going to allow some inherent uses. It's the only zoning district we have that doesn't have a list of permitted uses in it. Can I add to that? Let me add to that. Um, at the council's discretion, as part of the zoning ordinance, if, if to change the zoning to SPC, the council can put in a parenthetical um, sort of denominator that says hotel in that. So it's SPC, the zoning is SPC, parentheses, hotel, which would then designate that SPC zoning as hotel. We don't have resort as a as a use in the land development code, so hotel is the closest thing. So the council wants to do that to give the public some level of assurance that K and L will be SPC parentheses hotel. All it does is it designates that zoning as as some future hotel use. But as George said, nothing can be built, nothing can be permitted, nothing can be started worked on without that master plan going through essentially this similar process um, in in maybe somewhat of a shorter time frame, but, um, but that, so all of that process still happens and is, is, is uh, Commissioner Balagoski said that the, the, the buffering is happens at platting. So there, you know, lest anyone think that this is the last time that this body or the council will see this, it's just not accurate. I, I have a question, George Lee. Um, George, I've often, sought some information on the multifamily zoning in, in lot proportions A, B, and C. Yes, sir. Could you just give me a, a thumbnail sketch of what that zoning includes, like the height of the buildings, the density of the buildings, so how many units they, we could consider or they might consider putting in there? The number of buildings is certainly variable, depending on how much density they choose to put within the multifamily area. The multifamily high zoning district, which is what I, I um, think we have designated on that area on is proposed um, zoning, is um, the highest intensity use. It would allow up to 21 residential units per acre. The only way to achieve that is through uh, a planned development with a multifamily building. So you're talking about an apartment building or a condominium building. It's the only way you can get to that level of, of uh, density. But our multifamily density zonings also allow all of our single family zoning categories. So you would be able to put a single family neighborhood in instead of putting in um, an apartment building. It would be at the discretion of the developer it would require the subdivision planning process that will come back before this body as part of that, that process. Maximum building height for multifamily buildings and multifamily high zoning is 40 feet. That would allow a story, uh, effectively three story apartment building to go within that area. Uh, we don't normally see three story buildings in Prescott, but 
we certainly have some examples of three-story apartment buildings. Uh, should that go in, that would be um, limited in area because you have to also account for all of the parking that's required for those units. Multifamily parking is determined by the number of overall units, at a half a space per unit as gas space up to a max of 20, and then one parking space for each bedroom of each apartment unit. That's a lot of parking that can be required. Generally, what happens is the parking limits the amount of the area that the building can be built on. So you have a more or less isolated building with parking nearby or surrounding it. The benefit of doing that is the parking allows for a lot of landscaping to occur associated with it. And the landscaping around buffer around parking areas is clearly defined in the LDC. There are minimum requirements, there are minimum number of trees, shrubs groundscape material that would come into play at that point. So it could go anywhere from 21 units per acre down to individual single family homes within our zoning code, again, subject to a subdivision planning process. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions of staff for ADT South? Any questions on AED North? I have a general question, George. Certainly. If we have six potential motions we could make, can we make a seventh motion, say, on concerning the crossing of Key Line Trail at the hotel? It, it wouldn't be in the form of a motion, I think, but more of a recommendation. Remember last meeting, you gave staff a direction through a recommendation to us directly. Um, that's something that we could address unless but I think I think with I'm not sure and I, I, I can talk about this to George here um, it is it would would it be you know is a dealing with a, a the crossing for the hotel considered a zoning stipulation I'm not sure I, I guess you could try and I mean you you certainly could add it to um, let's see a motion number number two or number three, the master plan. Master plan. Maybe the master plan is a good place to then add a stipulation that says whatever you whatever recommendation this body wants to make to the council. <clears throat> so maybe that's the location or that's the place you would it. So it wouldn't be a separation, it would just be a condition or stipulation to the, the master plan motion. Okay, thank you. This is Ted Gamboji. And this is a question to our attorney. In your presentation last week, uh, didn't the um, POI say that that location would be at the city's choice? Yes, <clears throat> and that will be carried through in the development agreement. So to be clear, the, the city will choose the, the location of the cross under the LOI and as part of that development agreement. So we have an option to pick locations. Any other questions? I guess I have one more, Stan Galagoski for the city attorney. So if we were to redesignate the uh, force, forces K and L and for their, so for we're saying there's no for resort, will we do uh, SPC Hotel, is that a possibility or is that even in any of the motions? I, I, think, I think, again, uh, like, I'm not sure what the, the crossing idea is, but I'm gonna make a, an assumption that it's either over or under and not across. But I, I think you could also add it as a stipulation, uh, again, for council consideration. And as I mentioned before, the ultimate zoning ordinance can include that parenthetical that says hotel. So I would, if you're going to make that as a stipulation for your approval, let's say the master plan, um, I would use the term hotel because it's it's what it's in our land development code as a term rather than resort, which really isn't defined in in our land development code. Do you see any any um, would there be parameters if we did use a designation of hotel? That would limit what's in this agreement for those designated K and L parcels. Which agreement would be the, 
Uh, I'm sorry, the development agreement or LOI you're talking about? Yeah, when you say the LOI. Yeah, I, you know, we heard, we heard the applicant here essentially affirm publicly that hotel is, is the sort of jewel in the, in the anchor to whatever happens else. So, you know, I think you, you get those public comments um, and those public commitments from the developers. So I, I, I don't think it's going to jeopardize, you know, future negotiations because you hear the developers essentially commit, not essentially, commit to doing the resort there in, in that form. So I think if you if you if you approve the master plan on AEB South, which I think is motion number two, three, um, you can then add a stipulation again, like the crossing, whatever that whatever this commission wishes are, to add a second stipulation that says that says hotel is the use. Because again, I would stay away from resort or from any specifics that are for the development agreement oriented and stick to land development code type stipulation. And just as a reminder, and I'm not encouraging you to do this, when when this body, I don't think any of you were here, did deep well, there were like 19 stipulations during the zoning. Of course, that was a weird animal. I mean, it, it was, they essentially wrote their own land development code. So that's why there were so many stipulations. This one's fairly straightforward. Uh, again, it's a big deal, but it's fairly straightforward when it comes to the zoning decisions that, that you're being asked to make. Any other questions? Then we're open for recommendation, recommended actions for AED South. I hear a recommendation. This is Ted Gamboji. Okay, Ted. This is Ted Gamboji. I would like to uh, I would like to make, I move to recommend the equivalent of Prescott zoning upon annexation to be rural states two, which becomes RE2, single family 35, which becomes SF-35, and single family 18, which becomes SF-18. We have a motion, is there a second? Stan Golagoski has second the recommendation. Uh, we have a motion and second it. Any further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to, uh, Tom Hutchison here. I'd like to uh, add some comment. Go ahead, Tom. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I, I'm having trouble uh, hearing you folks, uh, so I'm glad you can hear me. As I explained at our prior meetings, um, <laughs> I must vote no on AED annexation at this time. Uh, the reason for that is I think the master plan is incomplete. My review of Prop 400 leads me to interpret it as requiring that any proposed master plan for annexation involving more than 250 acres must address the applicant's plans regarding water supply, endangerment, and safe yield. The master plan doesn't address water usage at all. The master plan in front of us doesn't tell us where the Peavine Trail will be crossed. The applicant seat wants to build a, or wants rezoning for a planned hotel, but there's nothing's been contracted yet after two years of study. I think Prop 400 mandates a lot more information. While I greatly respect the work that's already been done on this project. Um, City Attorney Palladini has noted, this is likely the most important planning and zoning, planning and zoning matter for the city of Prescott in 50 years. I'm, I'm not against this project. I just sincerely believe that additional, additional binding pre-annexation work needs to be done before the city council is asked to vote on it. The 60 day comment period is useless unless the public has some meat on the bones to comment on. This is what Proposition 400 is all about and why it was created. So that's my comment on where we're at. Okay, thank you, Tom. Any other discussion? I'd like to make a comment, George Lee. Um, 
I've done a lot of asking of uh, staff on these various issues and what I've come to realize, and maybe you can um, correct me or change my thought. It's my understanding that all of these things are going to be accomplished when the development agreement on each of these areas is brought before staff and city. And I don't think that we have the right to review or approve any of the information in the development agreement. I think that's simply council. Am I correct in any of my statements? Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Normally, we do not, at this level, at Planning Commission, discuss contract negotiations, which are what a DA is, a development agreement. Is. There are some very hard settings in the form of zoning, approval of master plans, determination of the initial zoning, etc. that are required by state law or Prop 400. Prop 400 is extremely explicit about what your job is, and that is to make a motion on a master plan. That's the only part of it that's your job. The rest of Prop 400 is in council's hands and has to be handled by them. Much of the rest of the negotiation that can occur about how much of this or how much of that, or more importantly, timing, is a development agreement. Timing of infrastructure, timing of placement of streets, timing when bridges get built or creek crossings get built, those types of things. Even the determination of do we put the trail crossing at the very north end of the property or the very south end. Is a, is a negotiated thing. It's not zoning. And it's not master planning in the form that we do it associated with the property. It is master planning in the form we do for the special planning communities district. We have an entire chapter in our land development code that defines what to do with SBC zone. But Prop 400 doesn't point to that. It, it leaves it very broad. So we have a broad master plan, uh, a, a 100,000 foot view master plan for Prop 400. And as you step down into various layers, the, the rezoning, and ultimately when you get to the resort area, the SPC zoning in its master plan, you're coming down in elevation, but you're increasing the level of complexity and details that you will see as part of your review and approval process. Some things can't be determined in advance without having some assurance to both parties which direction they're going. And that's generally why development agreements occur at council after you've made the hard zoning considerations and determinations through your recommendations. So that, that's kind of, hopefully that was on topic. One of the questions, so I understand that the commission has no real input in the development agreement as far as reviews or recommendations. Yeah, let me, can, I get, can I get that one? First of all, my answer to your first question would have been yes. You were correct. So, George is a little long, but anyway. We time. Here's the, the, you absolutely have, in, in fact, your comments throughout the last three meetings do have influence and impact and, and recommendations that, that may or may not be incorporated into the development agreement if that's the proper place for, for those comments, suggestions, and and, and uh, input goes. I mean, it may not go, it may go into a zoning ordinance, for instance, when we say the parenthetical is gonna be hotel. Um, it may go into the development agreement, it may go down into the subdivision planning later on. I mean, those are things that, that again, it, it, there's plenty, there's a lot of decisions that are made in votes that are made at the council. So you, you have input into the development agreement if, if that input is, properly placed in the development agreement. The problem, let me just address this development agreement issue kind of once and for all, and that is this. The problem is, is that you, if you were to see a, a draft development agreement today, it hasn't, it's not, the, the negotiations uh, have not been finalized. So you're gonna see a document that is pretty much, and in, in effect sort of meaningless because you are, is this body then going to negotiate with the developer for development agreement terms that may be inconsistent with what the council Negotiate. So all of a sudden, now you have sort of the city perhaps negotiating against itself. So, that's, so that, there, there's a sort of a practical reason why you, you don't have a copy of the development agreement simply because it's not ready for a, a review because we haven't received 
sort of responses from from the developer as to what you know what they think the development agreement should look like. So it's not a complete document, and it's really something that you would be seeing that would it could substantially change between let's say if you're looking at something today and let you look at something a week or two from now. That's why we went through the LOI because. That's something that all of those terms in the LOI, even though we use that term non-binding, the LOI is going to be incorporated into the development agreement. So those, those basic fundamental building block terms are going to be in the development agreement. And everybody agreed to that, the developer, um, the city, the city council, and, and the city council folks. Everybody came out and supported, hey, we want those basic terms in an agreement. And then that agreement's fleshed out. You can't. So everybody's committed, in, in my view, to seeing those terms that you've seen that we presented to you uh, last week or last week uh, when we talked about the LOI. So if, if there are, if, if your comments, if you have ideas, suggestions, stipulations about, let's say, the crossing, it may or, you know, I, I would say, let's say if you want to make a stipulation that the crossing go under the Peavine Trail or, or broadly, let's say the, the stipulation is, is that, that there's no um, at grade crossing of a roadway in the Peavine Trail. Let's say it's a fairly broad, so over under, however you want to do that. That at this point, it's probably best to put that as a stipulation to master plan approval. However, that may be something that's that's put into the development agreement later on because that's the better place for it. So that's why I think don't misunderstand that your comments, suggestions, ideas, input aren't being considered. And it's just where it goes in the series of votes that the council's going to have, which is going to be, you know, two or three times the number of the year considering here, you know, three, three per north, three per south, maybe six or eight for each parcel, uh, because there's a series of, of things that the council that this, this determines or decides upon, including the water issue. So that's kind of where it's all at. So if you have suggestions, um, if you have ideas, if you have stipulations, now's the time to throw those in. I think probably the best location to do most of those is probably the master plan. Um, motion. Any other questions, comments? Uh, just a question based on what Mr. Palladine just said to us. If we vote for the zoning now, then do we add stipulations after? No, the pro take? process would be, I'm sorry, the process would be as part of the motion. Let's say, because your next motion, your next number two is, is the master plan. So if, if a motion's made um, and, and, and any, any commissioner wants to add a stipulation to that, you would ask the, the, the motion in the second to add or to amend to add that stipulation. And then the motion in the second kind of gets to control that add or that takeaway. That's, that's the procedural rule. So, so the simplest way to do it is to make a motion uh, as stated on the board, you know, the number two, and then each commissioner could ask the motion, the mover and the second, would you add this to your motion and the mover and the second going to get to control that. The other option is for a motion to be made that includes the stipulations already, as many as you can, and then try and get a second, and then, but you can still go through and add other, other amendments, I guess, to that motion. Make sense? Right. George, that answer your question, okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? If not, we will take a vote on the motion that's made, and I'd like to have it be in Oops. No, I'm sorry, I think that was it. That'd be a roll call vote, Kaylee. Okay. Ted Gamboji? Yes. Stan Belagosti? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? Tom, um, you're muted. No, I'm not. I voted yes. Okay, Greg Lazell. Oh, sorry, Greg Lazell's not present. George Lee. Yes. Butch Tracy. Yes. John Michaelman. Yes. Motion passes six zero. Next would be the. Does it, any? Do I hear a motion concerning the number two item? Or yes, this is Commissioner Gamboji, and I move to recommend approval of the proposed 
master plan with the stipulation that it does not cross the Peavine Trail at grade. Did everybody understand the motion okay? So we repeat the motion. Yeah, do I hear a second to the motion? I would like to make a change to that motion. I'd like to add because here's really you need a second. You can then you can suggest adding amendments to it. This Dan Dalgowski, I will second it. George? Now what I'd like to add is that the crossing of the P vine trail be under the trail. Not leave it to where it cross that grade. I think that was part of the original. I'm sorry. I think that was part of the original motion. Kaylee, do you have that original motion? From today or previous? From, from, from Commissioner Cambodge, I thought he made the motion to approve the master plan with a stipulation. It was just a stipulation to be at grade, not specifically. Not at grade. Yes. Not at grade. Okay. And what I was asking is, is that I would like to change it that or add to it that the crossing of the Peavine Trail be under it. The, 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 the roadway crossing. Yes. So under the trail. Up, that would be up to Commissioner Gambogian and Commissioner Galagoski to agree to that that amendment, I guess, to the motion. I have not know to do this. Hold on, you have to one, one, just, just one, one at a time. Now, can we discuss that proposed amendment? Of Absolutely. Course? Yes. Okay. Do we hear a discussion? Yeah, yeah. Which, which crazy? You know, I, I don't think we know enough about it to determine whether it would go under it, over it, or, or anything else. Uh, do we even know what the width of that road, the any part of it? And I don't believe we know where it's going to cross at this point. Uh, they move it. Move it more north. There's no going under, and that would be a, a move point, I believe. But uh, anyway, that's all. That's the reason for making my point. Is um, <clears throat> last week when we had the, the applicant here, I asked him if he had any idea of the number of vehicles that would traverse that road on a daily basis, and I think if I'm correct. That he said somewhere between six or seven hundred vehicles a day because you've got staff, you've got supplies, you've got the visitors, you've got everything else. It could go even higher than that. It could go a thousand. <coughs> My point being, and the reason I'm asking you for it to go underneath the trail is that trail has been in the history of Prescott for years. You take it and all of a sudden it's 18 feet in the air. So that vehicles, the size of trucks that are going to be going underneath it, can traverse it, to me, destroys the trail. And I think that it is a small ask to the developer to say, your crossing of the trail needs to be subgrade so that the trail remains as it is and as it has been for years. Any other discussion? You know, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, and I did agree with part of it. The, when it's, I guess if, if we determined it had to go under, that would probably designate where it had to cross also. That would change their, their options. So that being said, I... Just, just in response to that, we, we have shown you both the drone footage and the mapping of it. The further south the trail goes into the designated public open space, the more engineering wise you can go under the trail without changing the trail's elevation as part of it. So it would require a shift to the south away from the area that was recently discussed, which was shifting all the way to the north. <clears throat> Again, that would require either the trail or the road to go over the other. And again, just to point out, as Mr. Palladini said earlier, the location of the trail, its horizontal placement north or south along that, that location, crossing is within the the authority of the city council to negotiate into the development agreement. So the city council can say, it's gonna be as far south as we can get it so that it goes under the trail if they follow Commissioner Lee's recommendation, or they could say, no, we don't wanna go into the open space, we're gonna keep that at grade. One more thing. Um, 
Mr. Baines, if you might have something to say on the matter. I, before I introduce him, have a procedural question. We're in the middle of a vote here. Are we allowed to have public? Well, we're, 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 you're just as close as that. Joe's not going to be a I know. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, it's steps in your job. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here, here, here's, here's just to where all things are say base here. You have a, a motion and a second. And the motion was to approve the master plan with stipulation that the crossing for the, the, the hotel resort area be not at grade. Um, and then there's now there's a request by Commissioner Lee to amend that stipulation to um, change that to the roadway uh, being under the trail, essentially, I think the word is subsurface. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would just suggest if that's a condition or, or, or comment that you guys want to make, that we separated grades. Same thing, please. Oh, Joe Baines, Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Prescott. Uh, I would just recommend if that's going to be a stipulation that we just uh, term, the terminology can be separated grade. I would, without any engineering, I'd be hesitant to. You know, say it's definitely going to go under. Likely it would go under, but I think separated grade probably gets the point across that you're trying to get across that doesn't limit us, again, without any engineering, it doesn't limit us to just that one going under. My suggestion. Tom Hutchison here. This is what I was talking about. You know, what we need here is a, <laughs> is a thorough engineering analysis that tells us where the, where the best place is and what the pros and cons are against that. We're, we're not in a position to decide this. We, we need the data. And, and that, that's, that's what I've been talking about. Thank you. Any other comments? So the ball is in um, Commissioner Gamboji and Commissioner Belgowski's court to determine whether they would agree to amend the, the motion and stipulation. Okay. This is uh, Commissioner Gamboji. <clears throat> There's a number of ways to cross the Peavine Trail, not at grade. Uh, one is to tunnel. One is to build a bridge over for the vehicles. Another is to build a, um, a uh, walking bicycle path what we don't know at this stage is not just the number of vehicles that go in and out, but the size of the vehicles that go in and out because trucks have to go into that hotel complex. So I think that just as the details will come before us in the future as they develop, I think um, uh, saying that it's not a grade or to, what was the term that the uh, parks commissioner used I believe that was great separated or separated. separated. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. I would agree to amend it to that it be grade separated. <clears throat> but I don't think we're at the stage now where we can be more definitive than to say that it should be grade separated. So that would be. Uh, then up to Commissioner Galgowski, he since he was the second to agree to that change. Yeah, this is Stan Galgowski. I concur with uh, Commissioner Gamboji, and not, I won't. I'm not going to change my second. So just the, the language of the motion, rather than not at grade, would be changed to separated at grade or grade separation. Yeah. Is that the amended? Yes. Okay. Yeah, then, okay. then, yeah, if that's saying basically the same thing, then I would, I would second that. Okay. Do we have any further discussion before we vote? Kaylee, if you do a roll call vote on this, please. Ted Gamboji. Yes. Stan Belagoski. Yes. Thomas Hutchison. No. George Lee. Yes. Butch Tracy. Yes. Don Michaelman. Yes. Tom, would you want to state why you're voting no for the record? Um, yeah. Sim simply, the master plan is insufficient and incomplete. 
Okay, the motion passes five one. Okay, now we're on to the third potential motion for AED South. Do I? I'm Chairman, there's, there is a member of the public, Paula Burr, who has raised her hand to speak. Yeah, at this point, Mr. Chairman, you are in, in the process of taking motions. I think it's a late. Yeah, I'm afraid I would agree with John. We're at a stage right now, we're not taking public comments. I'm sorry, Paula, but we can't. Do we hear a motion? This is Commissioner G this is Commissioner Gambogi. <clears throat> I move to recommend approval of the proposed rezoning to NOS SF6 SPC with the stipulation parentheses hotel end of parentheses and MS-8 H. H. We have a motion. Do we have a second to this motion? I'll second it. Right. We have a motion and seconded. Any discussion? Does, this is Commissioner Sandy Dalagoski. Does the stipulation of SPC parentheses hotel, do we have to make it specific to parcels K and L? I, I, I think, I, yes, no, because the SPC is specifically for K and L. Great. Okay. And if no further discussion, Kaylee, would you do a roll call, please? Ted Gamboji? Yes. Stan Balagoski? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? No. George Lee? Yes. Butch Tracy? Yes. John Michaelman? Yes. Tom, would you like to state specifically why you want to vote no? Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about the... Uh, SPC zoning in particular, uh, that, that feels like a blank check to me. Okay. Now we move to AED North. Do I hear a motion concerning the first item there? This is to Commissioner Gamboji. I move to recommend equivalent city of Prescott zoning upon annexation to be rural estates, two acre, to RE two acre. We have a motion. Is there a second? Butch Tracy. I'll second. All right. A motion and second. Any further discussion concerning this? If not, Katie, would you call a roll call vote? Yes. And I also wanted to state that the previous motion passed 5 1, uh, the last motion for AD South. So regarding this one, Ted Gamboji. Yes. Stan Balagoski? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? Yes. George Lee? Yes. Butch Tracy? Yes. Don Michaelman? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Do I hear a motion for the second item on AED North? This is Commissioner Gamboji. I move to recommend approval of the proposed master plan as submitted. We have a motion. Is there a second? Stan Dalagoski, I have a uh, second. We have a motion and seconded. Any further discussion concerning this motion? If not, Kaylee, would you do a roll call vote, please? Ted Gamboji? Yes. Stan Dolagoski? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? No. George Lee? Yes. Which Tracy? Yes. John Michaelman? Yes. Tom, would you like to make a comment on why you voted no? Uh, yeah, essentially the same, same reason given before, that I believe the master plan is incomplete and insufficient. Okay. Do I hear a motion concerning the third item for AED North? Yeah, to complete the hat trick, this is Commissioner Gamboji. And I move to recommend approval of the proposed rezoning to NOS, IG, IT, MU, SF6, and parentheses, MH, end of parentheses. 
Do we have a motion? Is there a second? Which Gracie? Motion is seconded. Any discussion concerning this motion? If not, Kaylee, would you call the roll call vote, please? Ted Gambogi? Yes. Dan Goligoski? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? No. George Lee? Yes. Butch Tracy? Yes. John Michaelman? Yes. Tom, would you like to give a statement on why you voted no? Yeah, the root of my concern is essentially airplanes flying in the pattern at a thousand feet or less over a whole bunch of houses that have to somehow be designed very efficiently, very cheaply, that satisfy a 45 dB requirement. I, I, I just need to know a whole lot more about that. Okay. And I think that is what we have on our agenda today. Mr. Chairman, you, um, you as a body made a recommendation to us regarding the ASAP at your last meeting. We've taken that recommendation. We're moving forward with that. And staff doesn't have anything else for you today. The meeting is adjourned. Good meeting, everybody.